Okay, I'll be reading um, a single verse, Matthew 9, 13. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Our second scripture reading comes to us today from the prophet Micah. Let us hear now God's word to us. As for you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, though you are the least significant of Judah's forces, one who is to be a ruler in Israel on my behalf will come out from you. His origin is from remote times, from ancient days. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor gives birth. The rest of his kin will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. They will dwell secure because he will surely become great throughout the earth. He will become one of peace. When Assyria invades our land and treads down our fortresses, then we will raise up against him seven shepherds and eight human princes. With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with eternally burned offerings, with year-old calves, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? He has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires from you, to do justice, to embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this isn't the most obvious passage for Dedication Sunday. Would God be pleased with thousands of shares of Apple stock? With a pledge many times higher than last year's pledge? No, that's not what God desires. Now, before Linda or Mark can come after me with the shepherd's crook, <laughs> let's turn to the prophet Micah. Micah lived in the southern kingdom of Judah in the last half of the 8th century before the Common Era. The northern kingdom of Israel was captured and conquered by the Assyrian armies in 722, so Micah and the rest of Judah had a front row seat to the siege and fall. Imagine seeing the whole world around you, including your religious and your tribal siblings, totally subjugated under the power of a brutal and seemingly unstoppable force. Families were ripped apart, and once great kingdoms were reduced to rubble, entire groups forced to leave their ancestral homes. The writing is on the wall, and you're next. If you take a look at this map, you can see how over the course of 150 years, the Assyrian Empire spread from the dark green region to everything in light green. Many scholars consider this to be the first major world empire. That small island of yellow was the kingdom of Judah. That yellow in a sea of green is a miracle. Somehow, against all odds, Judah survived the Assyrian threat. Now, of course, the Assyrian Empire was replaced by the Babylonian Empire, which did eventually conquer and subdue Judah, but these later verses from Micah were most likely written after all of that, and so the memory of this survival against Assyria could have been a source of hope. When the whole world around you is falling apart, what can you do? Where can hope be found? Judah's first instinct was to lean into the worldly values of wealth and power. They had, after all, managed to survive, 
by paying big tributes to the Assyrian Empire and now facing judgment once again. If they gave all the riches of the kingdom, if they sacrificed their own children, would that be enough to secure the reprieve? When the world seems to be falling apart around us, how do we respond? Often in similar ways, banking on wealth or on power to pull us through. Those of us who were gathered at the Faith in Action event a few weeks ago heard a strategic refrain, organized power, organized people, organized money. And it's a good way to achieve change, working within the power structures that be. And those changes are important. Life will be easier for many of our neighbors if we can improve access to affordable transportation. And if we can increase options for quality and affordable childcare while also ensuring fair and respectable living wages for those who provide it, that will be huge. These are important concrete changes. They will address some very basic challenges and promise to make a lot of lives better. And it's kind of a drop in a bucket for a lot of large problems. Don't get me wrong, we will keep dripping into that bucket and trying to turn the faucet up. We'll keep voting, we'll keep organizing, we'll keep working within these systems. But I'm also thankful that our faith, which fuels all of that work, also shows us another way. What can we do? Do justice, embrace loving kindness, and walk humbly with God. It was a countercultural strategy then, and it still is today. And to be honest, it doesn't sound like much of a solution. Can you imagine this as a campaign slogan? Walk humbly, 2024. <laughs> and the crowds go wild. <laughs> or in a boardroom, we don't really need to toot our own horns this year. Let's just be humble. Promotions all around. Probably not. Those aren't the values of our world. Will and I have enjoyed watching the show Ted Lasso. He, I know many of you have too. <laughs> Each episode is packed with little nuggets of wisdom, and one lassoism is this. Doing the right thing is never the wrong thing. Yes, we should do justice and embrace loving kindness and walk humbly with God. That's the right thing to do but we know it's not always rewarded. Following Micah's advice is not often a winning strategy for change in the face of powerful people and systems. Still, it's what God requires. It's also the way of Jesus. Just before this threefold command, Micah prophesies that there will be one, a peaceful ruler who will become great in all the earth, and he will come out of Bethlehem, humble Bethlehem. A mighty leader from Jerusalem, maybe, but Bethlehem? Kind of reminds me of a small town in Georgia. The population is about the same as the number of enrolled students at my boys' elementary school. The median household is less, income is less than $30,000 a year, which is less than that uh, half the state of Georgia's and well below half of the national median. Atlanta, they've got power players, but you don't expect much to come out of a place like Plains. Plains, Georgia is Jimmy Carter's home. And if there has been a more humble leader in our national history, I couldn't name one. It didn't get him reelected, and he's not going to top any list for the most effective U.S. presidents, but the work that he's done since leaving office has been astounding. 
If you visit the website for the Carter Center, you will see this tagline, waging peace, fighting disease, building hope. And spend just a few minutes looking around the website, you'll start to get a sense for just how much of an impact this former president has made on lives all over the world. President Carter's life and work have been guided by these requirements of the God that he worships, doing justice, embracing loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. He's been a faithful follower of the one who came out of Bethlehem, the one who didn't usher in the political or military supremacy that many expected or hoped for, but who showed with his life what it looks like to do justice and embrace loving kindness and walk humbly with God. When it seems like everything is crashing down around us and closing in, of course we want to look for the surest and quickest way out. What will save us? We've just had our national elections, which are very important. Organizing people, power, and money has to happen if we want to see concrete changes in social and political policies. And that's still not going to save us. You might have noticed that Mark didn't get up here with his goofy dollar sign glasses this year. <laughs> Instead, he brought his property tax bill. That's a way to kick off a stewardship season. We are facing bigger challenges moving into next year, and we are not alone. And to top it all off, no pun intended, it turns out we need a new roof over the sanctuary. What's going to save us? Now, higher pledges and any gifts of Apple stock you might have won't hurt, that will help with the roof over our heads and the roof over my head and Victoria's head and Gwen's head and our families. And it will help to meet the increasing mission needs in our community and beyond. And it will help us be better stewards of the building and grounds and all of the gifts that God has entrusted to us. But it's not going to save us. Short-term problem-solving works within the systems of money and power that drive most things today, and we are called to engage those systems and to do so as wise stewards of the resources that have been entrusted to us. And we are called to pursue a better way. God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven change happens slowly through methods that seem all too meek and mild by most standards. Some might say milk toast. You say that everything is falling apart, the earth is burning, civil wars are brewing, health crises heap upon us, inflation and economic strain are bearing down, we have poverty and racism, hunger, addiction, wars, gun violence. God, what are we to do? Do justice? Love kindness? Walk humbly with God? It sounds like inaction. It sounds like another offering of thoughts and prayers. It sounds like focusing on personal behaviors rather than large-scale change. So it's a good thing that we have Jesus to show us what it really looks like. It's not nothing, it's the thing. We need salvation on a cosmic scale, a world where money is meaningless and power is creative and collaborative. The salvation that we need is the restoration of relationship and wholeness with God and with each other, and the establishment of justice and peace, and the recreation of everything else. That salvation comes through God alone, who took on flesh and bone, who was born in lowly Bethlehem, and who showed us a better way. Do justice, love kindness, 
and walk humbly with God. Amen.